So um, <clears throat> I'm here to talk to you today about doomed point of sale system. So if you're not here for that talk, then uh, <laughs> uh, I hope you enjoy it anyway. Um, so my name's Nolan Ray. Um, I'm a former security consultant and uh, I work as a uh, security engineer now. Um, and I'm sort of an adrenaline junkie, uh, an outdoor day drinker. I'm romantically available, so keep that in mind, you know. Um, <laughs> And of course, I'm a hacker, which is why I'm here today to talk to you guys um, about our target, right? So after a couple drinks and uh, eBaying things that make my uh, credit card statement sad later, um, I bought a whole bunch of these uh, Verifone MX900 series terminals. There's the 915 and the 925. Uh, they're pretty similar, so I'm going to mainly focus on the, the 925. Really, the only difference is the display size. Um, <clears throat> Awesome. So uh, basically, uh, I, my motivation for this talk is that these things are everywhere. So I hopped out of uh, my cab, actually, or hopped into the cab at the airport on the ride here, and there was actually one of these sitting on the back of the seat. And also, uh, I assumed it would be a pretty hard target, and I love hacking at hard targets. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes, also, companies use these uh, and actually encryption on these terminals to justify really weak access controls elsewhere in their network. And uh, I don't think that's great. And also, the companies that do care often don't have the internal resources to validate any security claims that vendors make um, or, and really investigate the security of these devices themselves. So I wanted to shed some light on that from a third-party perspective. And of course, really, um, I just love Doom. Uh, and I wanted to play Doom on one of these things. And you know, uh, so I had to do that. So um, what this talk is not, this is not an exhaustive comparison of all uh, pin pads or card terminals. Um, and it's not an endorsement or an indictment of any specific vendor. This is just one specific terminal that I decided to go after because I bought enough of them. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of where this is at. And it's not a guide to configuration or compliance. So if you're here for that, I'm sorry. Um, what this talk is, is an in-depth dive into one line of devices and how they're hardened and, of course, exploits. So hopefully you guys enjoy that. Um, so previous work uh, that other people have done, you've got lots of more nefarious people who don't want to run Doom and instead want to steal credit cards. And of course, a lot of, one of their common things is skimmers that they go after. Uh, and of course, uh, there was a little while back, a security research labs put Pong on a couple payment card terminals, and now that's more along the lines of like work that I support, you know? Um, <clears throat> and then additionally, uh, Cambridge uh, Research Labs uh, a Cambridge Computer Labs uh, actually does a whole bunch of work on tamper resistance of these different terminals and also just general EMV protocol exploits. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, additionally, at uh, RSA, uh, uh, Trustwave and Bishop Fox uh, guys actually presented a survey of previous point of sale attacks. And these, uh, you know, previous attacks, a lot, uh, analysis of them, and one of the really interesting things that came out of this, at least from our perspective for this talk, is that 90% of these devices actually use the default pin in the field. And that's going to actually matter a lot later as we keep talking. Um, and of course, you've got things like your target breach. So there's that. Um, <laughs> you know, we all know about that. So let's get knee deep in the dead and dig into the first level and look at how, like, an overview of our device. So. The first thing, uh, it runs Linux under the hood. You saw that little Tux Penguin in the first uh, photo. They call it VOS, I assume for Verifone OS. Uh, and it runs a 400 megahertz uh, ARM 11 32-bit RISC processor. And unfortunately, it runs the ARM v6 instruction set. So if you ever had to cross-compile anything for the original Raspberry Pi A and Bs, then you know how much of a pain in the ass it is to cross-compile anything for these devices. Um, but unfortunately, you know, that's, that's where it is. And of course, of course, it has uh, 512 megabytes of RAM, uh, 256 flash, 256 SD RAM, and uh, of course, uh, a four or seven inch display. So this is a massive display, you know, throw out your home entertainment center, get rid of your gaming computer, this is all you need. Awesome. So connectivity, how do these things talk to the outside world? So um, what you usually have is uh, there's a lot of different ways, and it completely varies depending on the device configuration and the store configuration. Um, what you see here uh, in this picture is actually an I.O. module uh, that you can swap in and out, and that supports Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, RS-232, these ancient I.O. Uh, modules from the MX-800 series, so if you have some really old hardware. 
can uh, s still use that with your newer payment terminals. And they generally expose the, the same functionality. That's kind of what matters to us here. You can request a transaction. You can uh, make it display different pages that have already been loaded on the devices, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> the truly remote attack surface of these devices, because obviously the, we always want to like have a completely remote exploit, that'd be awesome. Uh, but unfortunately, there's only two TCP ports open in normal operation. And this is only if you actually have a device that's running the Ethernet module, which a lot of them aren't. And these uh, services expect XML messages, and sometimes you get DHCP. Um, good luck, you know, writing some DHCP exploit if you've been sitting on an O-Day for that for a long time, you know. Maybe talk to me about it, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> so in normal operation of this, uh, you've got this formagent.exe running as user one, and that is actually an ELF binary, so I don't know why it's named .exe. But um, essentially, <laughs> that uh, kind of sits there and it handles all the different connectivity, uh, and it uh, communicates with all the configured interfaces. So that's usually USB or Ethernet. And really, you know, it doesn't expose much attack surface again, only two network ports if you're in, uh, <coughs> uh, if it's in Ethernet mode. Uh, and then there's also several daemons running as different users that expose uh, IPC for privileged operations. So if you want to request a card swipe, that's going on in the background, but you can't directly get to any of that functionality. So really for normal operations, like when one of these things is running in its normal operation mode processing credit cards without physically interacting with it, there's not a lot of attack surface. So what is that physical attack surface though? So first of all, uh, you've got the smart card reader, Magstripe reader, um, <clears throat> very limited attack space there. I'm not gonna say you couldn't pop an exploit with that, but if you do, like I will buy you many beers. Um, <clears throat> Uh, there's the USB host port, actually, and that's uh, the lower image of the two. Uh, that leftmost, or sorry, yes, uh, leftmost RJ45 jack is not Ethernet. That's actually USB. So these actually support uh, USB host, and you can plug literally any device you want into there. So you can plug in your USB keyboard, oh, anything that there's a driver for. Uh, removable storage, you know, you can get your keyboard and mouse for your gaming rig and stuff like that. That's, that's what's important there. Um, of course, you've got your uh, uh, USB over serial um, that usually talks to the host computers uh, if that's the way the device is configured to be communicating with the point of sale system. And you've got several COM ports as well for, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, of course, uh, more communications operations. And then there's an SD card slot because, of course, on your secure terminal you want removable storage. Uh, obviously these aren't really used, and usually they're on the back of the device where it's inaccessible um, unless you steal it. And there's this Berg port that supports the ancient uh, uh, MX800 series peripherals. <clears throat> so if we want to disassemble one of these and like start poking at it, because usually as like someone who's a little more low level, my first uh, you know, desire is to go after like a hardware exploit, dump the firmware so we can reverse the firmware and exploit things. But it turns out there's a bunch of tamper-resistant hardware in these, and it's actually done pretty well. And it's a uh, mechanical, um, generally mechanical mechanisms, such as the one pictured here on the left. That's actually a series of traces on the PCB. And if you drill into the PCB, you're going to trip one of them, and then you know you won't be able to tap into the device. And there's lots of these throughout the uh, the, the device's assembly. And the device really likes to wipe itself if you open it up. So that's kind of unfortunate. Um, but luckily, <laughs> it's not necessary to get the firmware. So, you know, I'm very lazy. I want to go back to outdoor day drinking, so why bother, um, you know, setting, like, doing some elaborate hardware hack and killing a bunch of these devices when it's not necessary. But I did void my warranty and uh, <laughs> that I don't think came with the eBay purchase and teared this apart for your viewing pleasure. Um, you can look at these in the slides later. Um, so really, that's kind of your uh, overall attack surface, but there's this magical mode called administrator mode, and this is great. Uh, and what we have here is if you walk up to one of these terminals and you press 159, and then you enter the default pin, which you can find in the manual online. Uh, I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader. And uh, <laughs> um, of course, now all of a sudden you have a massively increased attack surface. You still can't load your own arbitrary code on the device, but you can exercise a lot more functionality you can get all kinds of diagnostic information. So you can get all kinds of software versions and start pulling down those open source pieces of software, reversing them at the code level, uh, look for public CVEs, things like that. And of course, if you actually have signed firmware, or signed applications from, that are, that's traces up to the Verifone root of trust, you can install software. 
there's a little bit of a tack surface there as far as like, you know, fuzzing the uh, parsing of those pa like the, those packages and things. But unfortunately for our purposes, and we don't have a signature, uh, a, a certificate to sign this, so it's not very useful to us. Um, and of course, you know, the software updates, uh, this is a picture pulled from their manual. Um, it basically just says, if you don't have an intermediate certificate signed by Verifone, you're not gonna install software on this device, sorry. Um, and of course, uh, most of the uh, software update mechanisms actually require manual interaction. And so this is gonna matter because a lot of these devices in the field don't get software updates. So even though there's a lot of really good software updates that drastic, dramatically improve the security of these devices, a lot of them in the field don't get those. And of course the updates must be signed, so it's not very useful for us to install our video games. So, um, of course, we can load uh, encryption keys. Again, signatures required. Um, but more interestingly, we can configure a lot of uh, kind of configuration settings. So, for example, we can change all these Ethernet settings and reroute traffic somewhere else. Um, we can uh, essentially change all of the different settings in the, the user uh, mode program that's running. And most of this can be used, you know, some of this data gets maybe shelled out or maybe it gets parsed by something or changes some setting that gives us extra attack surface. So this is all areas you can kind of chase down different rabbit holes uh, looking for exploits. Um, but more interesting is this file manager. This is cool, right? I like managing files. Um, <clears throat> so you can actually use this to copy files off of the device to a removable storage you plug in via the strange RJ45 USB port. Um, but you can't copy anything to the device, unfortunately, because that would violate the whole signature uh, structure. But uh, a creative hacker, since it allows you to copy everything from the entire root file system, a creative hacker might go to proc self um, and you know copy some interesting files, and maybe you copy proc self CMD line because you want to find out what binary is running, uh, so that you can actually uh, you know copy that into IDA and start reversing it and looking for exploits. Uh, but when you do that, you might actually see that proc self CMD line is actually uh, CP your target file uh, proc, proc self CMD line. Uh, mount USB store. So, okay, it's shelling out to copy this. Well, that's interesting. What if we add some strange characters to file names, um, <clears throat> as a hacker usually does? And of course, with a couple semicolons, some uh, dollar sign IFSs, some weird forward slashes and directory structures, you can actually pop a command injection in this interface, and that gets you your first shell. So great, wow, we've got command execution, we're going along, this is gonna be so exciting, except really, we can't do anything. We need to start privilege escalating. Because it turns out this binary uh, is actually running as the sys4 user, and the sys4 user uh, actually can't backdoor our, um, <clears throat> our standard user mode application. It can't really get at anything interesting. It can't read the mag stripe data. It's pretty boring, uh, we're that level of access. So we start looking at ways to get root. And unfortunately, there are no SUID binaries <laughs> on the entire file system. So even if you knew the root password, you couldn't sue to root because SU is running as sys4. Um, there's only six processes running as root, uh, and only three of them expose IPC mechanisms. So really, these are your main way of trying to get root on the device. So this is a pretty hardened attack surface. Um, and of course, there's reasonably good file system permissions, and I would say on the newer models, even excellent uh, file system permissions. Um, and so uh, even if you manage to find some kind of issue with those that might let you tweak something to like pop an exploit on startup or something, you're still gonna end up with a bunch of GRSec issues because uh, functionality is separated by user, um, but GRSec is actually installed in the kernel and it heavily uses the role-based access controls uh, to kind of mitigate a lot of uh, exploits. Um, and of course, if you're trying to pop a kernel exploit, uh, GRSec's gonna make you have a bad day. Um, <clears throat> so patch levels, oh my. Uh, under the hood, this device runs the Linux kernel 2.6.31.14. So for those of you who keep track of Linux kernel versions, which is not me, I'm pretty sure it's behind. Um, <laughs> it's uh, in fact uh, not, like uh, it's, it's uh, far enough behind that uh, it's not actually up to date with the 2.6.3.1 line of security patches, but it is GRSec, so if you're gonna try and pop a kernel exploit, you're gonna be spending a lot of time doing that. It uses an outdated libxml2 and also a bunch of other outdated image parsing libraries. So I guess kind of across the devices, you'll see uh, open source software is 
often not as updated as it could be, but unfortunately, a lot of that is mitigated. Um, because especially in the newer versions of these devices, um, all binaries on the system are actually compiled with F stack protector strong. So all your stack buffer overflows become much harder to exploit. Um, and all writable partitions are actually mounted as no exec. So if you're trying to interact with something that uses like say a, sh a sys5 shared memory to pop an exploit, um, you're gonna have a very bad time because you can't actually compile your C code, drop it on the system and execute it. You're constrained to using what's on the file system already. And so you'd actually have to pop an exploit, uh, a memory corruption vulnerability in something that you can execute as your own user just to be able to load an arbitrary code to exploit something running as another user. Um, and of course, GRSEC prevents um, <clears throat> any of those uh, no exec bypasses of the old 2.6 line. And uh, there's also a very aggressive GRSEC rule-based access control. So even if you somehow gain permissions as a different user, you're still fairly constrained about what you can do. And uh, in the newer versions, uh, many bugs are patched, but still not all. There's still a lot of code here that uh, just, uh, they're slowly churning through fixing bugs, but uh, there's still plenty in there. Now, so let's start looking at those root services, uh, because those are probably our most interesting privilege escalation attack point, because we need to privilege escalate so that we can end up uh, being able to access the frame buffer and run Doom. So uh, first of all, you've got klogd and syslogd and ifplugd. Uh, those are pretty boring, but more interestingly, the three that expose IPC, you've got user local sbin seconds, uh, VFI net control, and SVC net control. The later two, uh, we're gonna dive into each one of these. The later two uh, are obviously networking related, and seconds is, interestingly enough, security related, uh, and that's pretty interesting. Um, there's also a ton of non-root services you could try and pivot through to gain more privileges or maybe be able to access the magstripe data, but I didn't take that route. I wanted to go straight to root. Um, <clears throat> so if we st oh, uh, download, you know, through our file manager or now our shell, uh, VFI net control and start looking at it, it exposes IPC uh, via uh, VFI net control. Uh, it's basically a, a Unix named pipe. And then it exposes about eight operations and they're all networking related, and they're actually pretty boring. So you can pretty quickly reverse all eight of those handlers, and none of them have exploits, and that makes me sad and probably people who pay with credit cards happy. Um, <clears throat> however, uh, seconds is much more interesting. Now this is a security related binary, and I was like, great, let's go for that next. Um, it handles package installation and security, so there's a lot to learn there. It handles IPC via a Unix socket, and uh, it also handles GRSec configuration on startup of the device, which is really interesting. Uh, and it also has lots of other interesting functionality, you know, CH owning files uh, or requesting files to be CH owned if certain criteria are matched, things like that. Um, and of course, so we want to reverse all this functionality. and. Uh, it ends up, if you load it up in IDA and take a look at it, it's got uh, essentially uh, an opcode uh, jump table uh, with 22 supported uh, IPC opcodes. Um, and each one of them contains fairly complicated functionality. And if you spend all of your time looking at this and you spend a couple weekends, you know, kind of beating your head against a wall looking for vulnerabilities in each one of these, you'll find out that it's clearly pretty well audited relative to some of the other code that's sitting on this system. Uh, I guess it had security in the name and it probably makes sense that people looked at that. Um, <laughs> so after that, you'll be really sad uh, and then decide to maybe try for a softer target and take a look at the only other option that's easy, uh, for, uh, easy for privilege escalation. So that leads us to SVC net control. This exposes uh, IPC via shared five, uh, a sys5 shared memory interface, so it's kind of a pain in the ass to like interact with. Um, but it allows limited users to request changes to network interfaces, and so it actually shells out a ton. Um, and so that's obviously pretty interesting. And it exposes numerous different functions. So it, you, it lets you set up different network interfaces, add routes through XML, set the NTP server, all kinds of really fun stuff. Um, and it also has this beautiful binary sitting right next to it called SVC net test that exercises a lot of this functionality. So if you're trying to reverse it so that you can, you know, pop an exploit and run Doom, uh, that's pretty handy. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, this is what that function looks like in IDA. Uh, this is the IPC handler, and each one of those little bottom blocks or most of the bottom blocks jump off to extremely much more complicated functions that handle 
all kinds of things. So obviously there's a lot of attack surface here. And so digging into this, uh, I started going through each one of those boxes that calls out and looking for vulnerabilities because, I, yeah, that's, that's what I do with my life. Um, <clears throat> so eventually I found one that was interesting. I found this uh, SPRINF to PPPD uh, with uh, dollar sign S or percent S's. So obviously you can see this would potentially be a command injection. Uh, but <clears throat> unfortunately, a lot of the shell meta characters are, oh, well, unfortunately for us, uh, a lot of the shell meta characters are actually um, uh, escaped. However, uh, and spaces are also escaped. But if we look at the, uh, the manual for PPPD, you'll notice that there's this beautiful connect option that actually allows you to call out to an arbitrary script to set up uh, the environment. And so <laughs> you can actually, uh, although they've filtered out spaces, they didn't filter out vertical tabs or regular tabs. So you can actually uh, call this uh, IPC handler and instead of an IP address or with the IP address, add some uh, interesting connect script functionality. Uh, and then uh, the, it'll actually happily execute that for you. Um, as soon as uh, <clears throat> uh, it, it, as soon as you invoke it, so now all of a sudden this is this is a service running as root, and it'll execute our arbitrary skip script. So we get root. Awesome. We're super excited. We're like root. Let's run Doom. Let's start having a party. We'll get a LAN party together with these extra devices, and then Gersec. Uh, this <laughs> is uh, very unfortunate. Grsec uh, kind of made me have a nice bad day. Uh, and so GRSEC's role-based access controls actually restrict even the root user for most file system access, unless it's specifically running under certain binaries. Um, and so with that, uh, we still can't ptrace seconds, which would be really interesting for uh, uh, dynamic reversing. And there's no ac access to the magstripe uh, read writer or the smart card uh, reader. And uh, of course, you know, that's um, unfortunate if you're trying to steal uh, credit card data. And for our purposes, we still can't access the frame buffer, so we can't run Doom, and that's what we want to do. So this is very frustrating. So what are our options? You know, we can uh, continue staring at the seconds uh, IPC handler, hoping that we missed something the first time, because um, I'm not very good at hacking. Um, uh, or we can go for a kernel exploit. Uh, but unfortunately, GRSEC's going to make that very hard. Uh, or we can get creative, uh, and I like to get creative because I want to go back outside and, you know, <laughs> get away from my computer. So uh, as we're brainstorming, uh, we can start and stop other processes with different uh, GRSEC role-based access controls. So maybe we can find something that does something interesting that we can trick to do something more, trick into doing something more interesting. Uh, and we can also send signals to other processes. So this is uh, interesting. Maybe we can send a SIG9 and tell something to stop in the middle of doing something. Uh, that could be interesting. Uh, uh, lots of race condition -y ideas there. And of course, uh, seconds can start and stop uh, GRSEC with GR admin, and it does this on startup or any time you invoke the binary. Um, and on startup, it actually turns out if you start reversing that code, looking for maybe some kind of exploit you could pop during the boot chain or something, uh, you'll actually find that uh, GRSEC disables the role-based access control, or sorry, seconds disables the role-based access controls, then re-enables them to ensure that the rules are loaded correctly. Uh, and it does that instead of refreshing them, and I don't know why. Um, but uh, this is obviously kind of a, a race condition issue. So you can see here uh, from the binary, there's the GRSEC uh, GR admin password of 123456. Um, however, that doesn't actually get you anything because the role based access controls stop you from invoking GR admin, which is what you use to disable GRSEC. Um, so you still can't use that password, but what you can see is there's, uh, it sets the password and then it uses the dash D option, re executes the program to disable the rules uses the dash E option to execute the program and re-enable them. And of course, uh, this is a race to the finish. So we can actually kill the currently running version of seconds, start it up again, uh, wait for it to turn off the role-based access controls, kindly ask it to stop running <coughs> uh, before it re-enables them, and then we have the GRSEC role-based access controls disabled. So now we have a full chain from the file manager all the way up to running root on these devices. So that's awesome. So that brings us to our demo time. Um, and hopefully, hopefully I've sacrificed enough to the demo gods that this works. Um, no, there it is. 
All right, so we've got our terminal here. Uh, the screen has changed. Uh, this is just a JPEG I swapped out, be uh, but I actually got this, uh, and it had the, the application from the previous company that owned this terminal, uh, so I obviously swapped that out. But here, we'll uh, take a look. <coughs> hmm. Can I uh, remove this? Is this? Yeah. Sorry. All right. All right. Well, um, Testing. Oh, there we go. All right, awesome. So we have our device here, and we can walk up to it. And then, uh, so normally you would need to plug in your USB drive. Uh, I already have that plugged in just to automate this a little bit faster. The port is exposed on the back in most installations. And we can press our 159. This is going to bring up our administrative mode. Hopefully it's not too washed out, is it? Let's see here. Lower the exposure. There we go. All right. There we go. All right. So then we can enter our password. Uh, that's going to bring up our administrative menu here. And then we can actually go into the file manager. Oop. And it's a little touchy. And then go to our root file system, our mount location our flash drive with strangely named files, lots of strangely named files, and then we can tell it to copy that file, and now our exploit chain's gonna run. Uh, and <laughs> this is gonna take a minute because I'm bad at coding and my race condition doesn't successfully win all the time, um, so I rerun it over and over <laughs> um, until it works. Uh, so this uh, this is gonna take just about, it usually takes about 30 seconds, so all the interaction that you've seen so far is all that's actually required for the jailbreak. You can actually walk away from the device at this point, but, um, <clears throat> and then every, it, you know, it, you could manually script it to, like, actually go through and, um, you know, just, uh, complete the backdooring and reboot into the main app. Um, <clears throat> but of course we're gonna launch our video game, maybe, if the demo gods love us. <laughs> I'm going to get a drink of water here. Well. Give it one more second. Sometimes Doom's, Doom takes a second to boot. If not, we'll just run it all again. <clears throat> of course this would happen. <laughs> Ran this like 10 times and not a single problem earlier today, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of people back there. <laughs> <laughs> and who? All right. Yeah. Some version numbers. Oh, well. <clears throat> Let's see here. And yeah, I'll, I might switch over to the video. Um, go let this keep going. We'll see. Frustrating. Oh, no, there it goes. Here we go. All right, it ran. All right. All right. It works. <laughs> All right. It works. Awesome. So this is a fully playable Doom that we have going on here. So this is pretty cool. Um, so you can actually start a game, and uh, we can like start navigating around. You know, doing this. It's it's a little clunky. You know, really. It's probably not my ideal gaming system, but you know, we're on a budget, so. Um, <clears throat> So of course, you know, um, you know, in, in this modern economy, we, we, you know, have to pay for everything. So I'm gonna swipe a card here. Uh, this is, I believe, four, 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 four uh, credit card, and that will trigger uh, some cheat codes and get us 
an amazing little, uh, well, that's what we want. Like, that's, yeah, that's better. All right, let's see here. Let's attack the barrel. Oh, okay, see, we, we probably should have got a health plan. So I assume that in a world where uh, hell has come back to Earth, the Republicans are still in Congress, and health plans cost a lot. But uh, <laughs> luckily, you know, um, we have a, a black card here. Um, I don't know if you can. So we have a lot of money, and we can just buy amazing health care. And then uh, we can get God Mode, which is pretty cool. And then we'll buy another uh, <laughs> another chainsaw here. And then uh, <laughs> we'll get that back. And let's see here. Doo -doo -doo. Now we can go about the, the real uh, goal of Doom, which is, I assume, disposing of all these dangerous barrels. Oh, wait, did God Mode turn off? Oh, well. Well, you know, uh, e even with enough money, sometimes things get you, I guess. But anyway, all right. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the demo. Cool. So that's the end of demo time. MC Hammer is sad. <clears throat> All right. So what other interesting input do we have? Um, so if, if we were a little more nefarious uh, or we're trying to, you know, uh, ex execute cheat codes when certain credit cards are swiped, uh, there's some interesting input files we can look at. So we've got uh, dev AMSR, which is your magstripe read writer, and now that we're fully jailbroken, we can access all these. Um, you've also got your smart card uh, read writer uh, that allows you to basically transceive uh, protocol messages over... Um, <coughs> uh, over, yeah, via IOCTLs. There's some more stuff that I haven't reversed that looks like it's related to the smart card. And of course you've got your dev input event too, which is your pin pad, and that's just a standard keyboard. So you can actually just cat that file, monitor all the scan codes, and then uh, actually uh, just extract people's pins that are entered from that uh, once it's fully jailbroken. Um, persistence. So if you want to actually uh, persist this, uh, <coughs> uh, these actually have, because uh, ideally right now, the state that it's in, if I reboot this, it'll be clean. Um, the device actually has uh, a pretty decent secure boot implementation. I'm still kind of looking at that. Um, but uh, essentially what happens is there are software packages uh, that are tar files, and they have a P7S signature file sitting next to them. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, these are actually all verified and then extracted onto the file system uh, at boot time. And so it requires, uh, you have to find some kind of either exploit in that parsing code, which uh, is going to be actually kind of hard because if the parsing fails uh, and you don't immediately pop an exploit, it deletes the package. So the next time you boot up the device, it doesn't have it. So I'd recommend not trying fuzzing that with like something that's system critical because you'll turn it into a, a doorstop really fast. Um, <clears throat> and of course, so essentially you're going to need some kind of exploit that runs on boot time. And these are uh, <clears throat> um, definitely possible to find. Um, so there's lots of config options, things that are parsed, different, you know, images and other things that you might be able to go after, drop something that'll get run on boot. Uh, but it is going to require a substantial amount of effort to uh, port this over so that it persists across reboots. Uh, however, these devices aren't rebooted very often. Um, uh, data exfiltration, if you want to get uh, data out of the um, uh, the system. You've got your uh, store network slash internet. Um, and a lot of these store networks actually allow you to route traffic directly out um, because they're not very, not secured very well because they're excited that uh, the, every credit card number is encrypted on the device. So um, a lot of times that's an option to you. Or you can plant some type of pwn plug and, you know, if you can't route directly out to the internet, somewhere else within the store network to collect data and send it out. Um, of course, if the device isn't connected over Ethernet, you can't do that. But again, a lot of times these point of sale systems are secured very poorly because they, uh, uh, oftentimes merchants rely on these terminals to provide the security. So you can probably either exploit the POS system first and then propagate it down to the terminal or vice versa. Um, and then of course, if you have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth as a module, uh, there's a, a infinite amount of things that you can do uh, to exfiltrate data. You know, you can monitor for a specific MAC address and then, you know, set up a, a, a ad hoc AP as soon as uh, you see it and, like, send out data over that or something. 
lots of ways. You can also uh, write out data uh, over a smart card. Obviously, this requires manually walking up to the terminal and like inserting a smart card to dump them. However, after starting to go down this route, I redid my math, and you can only store about four to five hundred uh, credit cards uh, numbers like <laughs> on a smart card. So that's a lot of manual interaction for anything. So it's kind of uh, not that useful. Um, and of course there's all kinds of interesting side channels you could go on. So even if uh, the store network is completely locked down and you've also got um, uh, <coughs> the, uh, your point of sale systems hardened very well, you can actually still have a lot of like other side channels. For example, uh, so you could exfiltrate data over ultrasonic sound. You could use, uh, of course, there's all these uh, air gapping talks at Black Hat all the time, uh, air gap jumping talks at Black Hat where you actually uh, use different R incidental RF emissions to transmit data intentionally. Um, and of course, one of the more interesting ones is actually LED modulation. Uh, you could pretty easily put a camera trained on these uh, devices and actually uh, monitor the LEDs on the side and then modulate them to transmit data out. Uh, and that would actually be a pretty effective way to slowly migrate your card, um, uh, sorry, your card database off of the device. And of course, uh, mitigations. So, uh, uh, for mitigations, we have uh, obviously don't use the default pin. Um, so it's very important. <laughs> Everything I've presented here today can be eliminated by that, but again, 90% of the ones in the field use this default pin. Um, and so that's very important. That's a first step. Um, additionally, you really need to have a uh, a uh, process in place to actually update the card terminal software on hopefully a fairly regular basis. Um, I, I mean, even if it's yearly, uh, these terminals actually, their security improves leaps and bounds uh, between different versions of the software. And so getting that on there is very important, even if you only do it once in a while, because unfortunately it's a pretty intensive process to update these terminals, which is why a lot of times they're not done in the field. Uh, and of course, hard harden the rest of your store network and the point of sale systems that are connected to it. Um, and that's very important to prevent, you know, just defense in depth. So vendor response. Uh, obviously I reported these issues to Verifone, um, and they quickly responded, uh, to my vulnerability reports, uh, often much quicker than I could actually respond to them. So I, I thank them for the, uh, you know, being very, uh, quick about that. Um, and they were able to produce patches and in some cases they had actually already identified these vulnerabilities themselves and patched them. Uh, however, unfortunately a lot of these patches again don't get out to devices in the field. But overall I'd say, uh, Verifone was, uh, excellent to work with from a vendor perspective and they didn't, Sue me, so that's awesome. Um, <laughs> so takeaways, uh, <clears throat> um, use defense in depth to secure the entire store network. That's very important, right? Number one, uh, where there's a will, there's a way. So if you uh, move all of your security to a single device, even if it's well hardened, uh, you can still, uh, it'll, someone will still get through. And of course, don't let all your security rely on a single third party device. And more research should be done into different brands and product lines. So, uh, hopefully someone will go out and look at the other brands and see if, you know, this is, uh, you know, if all of them are well hardened like this or, uh, if there's other ones that are more well hardened, it'd be great to get more research, uh, that's, you know, kind of in the public eye. And of course, push for audits and transparency and not marketing and hopefully push for more automatic update mechanisms. Uh, right now, uh, unfortunately, it's pretty hard to update these. And, uh, um, <clears throat> so we actually would, uh, it's, if you have a whole bunch of these in the field, it's very important to go and, uh, you know, s kind of actually request that the update mechanisms, uh, function and function well and, uh, allow you to update them on a regular basis. <laughs> and, uh, that's about all I have for you. Uh, I'd li really like to give some greets out. Thanks very much to, uh, Fareed Katak for, uh, making my slide deck beautiful because I don't know how to do anything with any image editing programs. Uh, Mike Weber and, uh, Samoslav for putting up with my neurotic, uh, complaints and, uh, worries about this and also listening to me talk over and over. And, uh, Chaos Data as well for putting up with my crap. Uh, Richo for taking weird, uh, uh, request from me about ultrasonic stuff. And of course, uh, Dean Jerkovich for listening to very early drafts of this presentation, uh, multiple times. So thank you very much.